classic, but now make your Sunday lunchtime that bit different with BBC Two. Hello, I'm Queen Elizabeth II of England. <laughs> and I'm the Duke of Edinburgh, my friend, and I am Greek. <laughs> and I declare this show of this muff with Richard, not Judy, <laughs> open. Wake up, you! My mum was right about you. I should never should have married you. <laughs> oh, uh... I was dreaming of Lynette Newman. Flipper, king of the sea. Do they call you Flipper? Yes, they do, Stuart. No, listen to the question, the words in it, do they call you Flipper? Oh, no, some kids at school call me Kipper. Kipper Herring. Yeah. <laughs> and are you the king of the sea? No, I'm the, I'm the mayor of Western Supermare. Are you? <laughs> no, I hold no dominion over any of the land's world surfaces. Good. <laughs> Just once, won't you let me win? And coming up later in the show... At 12.21, we'll be looking at another of Channel 5's quality pieces of original programming, Can't Cook, Won't Cook in which some people who can't cook sit around in a kitchen and refuse to cook. <laughs> and at 12.32, David Beckham will be revealing how he'll never forget his son's name because it's tattooed on his back and we'll be helping him to never forget the last World Cup by holding him down and tattooing the words stupid, stupid, childish fool on his face. <laughs> At 12.47, we'll be meeting Charlton Heston, who will be explaining that it's not guns that kill people, it's Americans who kill people. <laughs> and at 12.59, we'll be talking to Britain's fattest shepherd. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> not that fat, Stu. Fat for a shepherd, let's oh, face it. Oh, I suppose it. so, yeah. And please welcome on the piano Wales's answer to Jean-Michel Jarre, Richard Thomas. <laughs> You've been eating ready break again, haven't you, Richard? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Stu, I was wondering, what have you been up to this week, Stu? Well, this week I've been doing one of my hobbies, which is to question shopkeepers and market stall holders who persist in misusing the possessive apostrophe, like that, when it says carrots, apostrophe S, 30p. <laughs> I find that stall holder and I say, oh, can I see the 30p that belongs to the carrot, please? <laughs> and the carrot that's so sophisticated actually owns 30p. I'd like to see that, a capitalist carrot <laughs> accumulating wealth. Go on, where are they? Or shall I prosecute you now under the Advertising Standards Act for advertising a carrot which can't possibly exist? <laughs> oh, I see. You didn't mean that. You meant that carrots cost 30p. Well, why didn't you say it? <laughs> um, uh... problem with that, Steve. No, no problem. OK. Anyway, what about you? What have you been up to well, this week? Well, all this week I've been doing one of my hobbies, uh, which is uh, looking down girls' blouses when right. I think they're not looking, <laughs> yeah. and then looking away quickly when they look up. Right, and um, <laughs> don't they realise you're doing that? Oh, no, Stu, I'm very subtle about it. A lot of blokes do it, Stu, and women never suspect a thing. <laughs> I said unto a fool, fool, if you sow barley, what shall you reap? And the fool replied, barley. <laughs> and I said unto the fool, fool, if you sow wheat, what shall you reap? And the fool said, wheat. Likewise said I, if you sow hatred, then you shall reap hatred. Ah, no, that's wrong, replied the fool, because in your example, wheat and barley are plant seeds which obey the natural laws of physics, whereas hatred <laughs> is a metaphysical concept, and therefore there is no reason to assume that it will behave in the same way. <laughs> I replied, no, it will. <laughs> he saw that he was wrong, and his heart leapt. Ferrero Rocher. Oh, Mr. Stew, you are spoiling us. Ah! Ah! No, I can't have it, Stu. 
I forgot to tell you, I'm on a hunger strike. Oh, I thought you were looking a bit skinny. Yeah, no, it's actually... <laughs> it's a National World Week for Animals in Laboratories this right. week, so I'm doing a sponsored hunger strike. For every minute I don't eat, British Laboratories will release one laboratory mouse into my care. And how long have you been on your hunger strike uh, now? This time, Stu, about four minutes. Right, so <laughs> since the start of the show, basically. Yeah. yeah. Look, the totalizer's already filling up, Stu. What's there. This? What are you doing That's now? My, uh, it's my mouse totalizer. You my can't mouse. treat the mice there like that, Rich. Four mice. I'm helping them, Stu. Up, oh, another minute, another mouse. Stick it in there. Damn you, Richard Herring! Damn you to hell! Uh, thinking about it, Stu, I will have that for our rush, actually. Right. Oh. So you've lasted five minutes now, Rich. Look, this time, Stu, but if you add all my hunger strikes together... What, by which you mean all the time when there isn't actually any food in your actual mouth? Yes, Stu, <laughs> obviously. Then this week alone, I've hunger struck for about 17 minutes. Yeah, that's 17... <laughs> 17 minutes out of a possible 10,080 minutes. Yeah, it's not bad. Don't knock it. Um, add those 17 to the totalizer, mad professor. <laughs> well, that's it. I'm on hunger strike again now, Stu. That'll teach old Tony Blair. Yeah, Rich, and it'll get you into the Guinness Book of Records as the world's fattest hunger striker, mm. won't it? <laughs> Never. Alien Resurrection. Current plot. After two hours of high-budget alien war, Winona Ryder and Sigourney Weaver observe the comforting sight of the planet Earth drifting into view. You did it. You see? <laughs> you sound disappointed. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I didn't expect it to be. What happens now? <laughs> Extra final scene. We hit the hut. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey. Cut to Weaver, Ryder, and cute alien sat around a restaurant table laughing as they divide up a huge pizza. Clear that the whole four alien films have been leading up to this one moment as part of a cunning and elaborate Pizza Hut campaign. We feel cheated. And then they les up. Now you remember last week's show. Well, on last week's show, Rich, when you turned your comic invective against the uh, homophobic House of Lords, Harriet and Baroness Young. Yeah, I satirised her good, didn't I, Stu? I had that yeah. picture of her, I was pretending to be her, I made her look a fool! Yeah, it was clever, Rich, <laughs> except that you had a photo of the wrong Baroness Young. There were huh? two, right? <laughs> There's this one, the homophobic Harridan, who you meant to mock oh, there. Yeah. And then there's another one, the uh, nice unprejudiced one there, who uh, wants us to point out that her views are the exact opposite of what was attributed to her <laughs> by this programme last week. And who is also deputy chairman of the BBC Governors. <laughs> who are our employers. Oh. Right. So, there's your P45. Thanks very much. <laughs> to know there are two Baroness Youngs. I'm not magic, am I, Stu? They've got totally <laughs> different political views. Well, you know, um, they have to be rich. It's like, uh, you know, the forces of good and evil in perfect cosmic balance. Right, the two, no, so the two Baroness Youngs, they're kind of like yin and yang, Yin Stu. and yang it is, Rich. No, it's yin and yang, Stu. My dad says yin and yang, yeah, and right. he should know. <laughs> but actually, it's more like young and young, isn't yeah, it? Or, yeah. or yang, young and yin, yeah, yang. Oh, yeah. On the yin, yang, yong, yeah, yin, yang. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it? No, it's like that. That's what it would be. Yeah, I hardly <laughs> Which I only think that is going to replace the yin and yang as a universal symbol of cosmic balance. It is yin and yang, Stu. How many times do I have to tell you? And now this week's aims, which have all been thoroughly checked by highly paid lawyers. Aim one is to snatch Liam Gallagher and Patsy Kensett's forthcoming child at birth, throw it naked into a city sewer to be raised by rats, in order to give it a better chance of having a normal life. <laughs> is to punish John McCarthy for not inviting Jill Morrell to his wedding by forcing him to marry Terry Waite. <laughs> Aim three is to snatch Bono Vox's forthcoming child at birth and have it raised by Patsy Kenzie and Liam Gallagher in order to give it a better chance of having a normal life. <laughs> Aim four is to prove that Marilyn Manson is responsible for everything bad that's ever happened, <laughs> ever, including the war in Kosovo, the Great Fire of London, 
and the death of Petra, the Blue Peter dog. <laughs> and our final aim is to have any market stall holder who misuses the possessive apostrophe tattooed on the face with the phrase, I didn't pay attention at school, and that is why I have to work in a market. <laughs> Selling fruit, which I mistakenly imagine has the ability to accrue wealth. All right, <laughs> leave it, Stu. It's not worth it. <laughs> bark, 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 bark. Shiver me timbers. It's me, Histor, Sky TV xenophobic historical crow. God, what are you doing, Pliny? I am shivering your timbers like you asked, Histor. <laughs> you asked me to shiver your timbers, and so I am shivering your timbers <laughs> by putting your timbers in this fridge. You stupid bird! Shiver me timbers... Feather me wingers... ..is a nautical <laughs> term meaning... Mean wing what, Histor? I never you mind. Mind like a bird's mind. <laughs> What's the news, Histor? Well, you won't have seen it on the grown-up news, but this week it has been St George's Day. St George's hay, like some hay that a bird might eat. But who is St George, Histor? I have never a bird egg wing. To find out <laughs> that, we must fly back in time as the crow flies. Egg the egg... fly. <laughs> This is this, Histor. This is France, Penny, in the Ancient of Days. The ancient earth, <laughs> like the French for egg, earth lays like a bird lays an egg. Who is that man coming here, Histor? Vindaloo! Vindaloo! That is St George, Penny, the greatest English man that ever lived. You may know him by his noble song. We're gonna score one more thing, you! <laughs> England! Yay! Hello there, Histor. Hello. It's me, St George. And I think, like, it's unfair that my day is never celebrated in the same way as the days of the patron saints of Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Quite right, St Whoa. George. Look at that, eh? <laughs> Yay, nice. Look at that. But surely, Histor, English people's reluctance to celebrate St George's Day is to do with anxieties about the violent nature of English nationalism. Right, um, Guardian reader, eh? Uh, hey! <laughs> St George is horrible, Histor. He hurt my bird's eye like an eye, which is German for egg. Good. <laughs> what are you doing with that ice, Pliny? I am preparing to shiver your tombra, Histor, by rubbing this on your neck, namely tombra, the distinctive tonal quality differentiating one vowel or sonant from another. You stupid oh. bird! Happy ah. St George's Day, ah. everyone! Ah, every ah. hen like a hen! Ah. 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 Make a pun ah. now! Ah. 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 Now, once again, let us prepare to meet the king queen. of this week's show. So please welcome those that shall serve him or, or her. her. Trevor and Natalie! Trevor and Natalie are What's the Trevor and Natalie! They're dressed as St George and the Dragon. Trevor here, you'll remember our small-faced man, of course, today, dressed as St George's Dragon. Trevor, your face, and by association, your tiny bee's mouth, <laughs> is so small, it's hard to imagine you posing a threat to any knight higher than two inches tall. No, ha, ha, ha! What? I'm getting He's heartily speech. sick of the way you exploit my disability. All right, Guardian reader, eh? Game, St George. Yeah, right. go on. <laughs> Kick him while he's down! In the head and small yeah. face, come on! <laughs> and in honour of St George the King or Queen of, of the, the show, show, we'll get whatever they do from this, loaded with all the things that Englishmen can be proud of. The St George Trolley! Land of hope and glory, mother of the free... Shut up! <laughs> Hold on. A 
a shepherd's pie, is that it? We must have done something better than that in England. No, that's all we've got to show for English heritage and no, culture. Must Try be... and think of something, anything. Uh, no, Nothing. There isn't anything no, right, that's yeah. why no one celebrates St George's Day, yeah. Stu. It's all cold in the middle, Rich. Uh, <laughs> Natalie, could you stick that back in the microwave for a couple no. of minutes? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm part Irish, actually. I'm Scotch. Oh, yeah, Scottish, you're Scottish, I mean. Okay. Scottish, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Those of you who recognise my human face will know that I am Simon Quinlack, the hobbyist who is without any doubt at all the king of all hobbies. Bow. <laughs> Those of you who do not recognise my human face, let me tell you now. I am Simon Quinlack, the hobbyist who is without any doubt at all the king of all hobbies. Bow. <laughs> Good. What you will need for this week's hobby? A metal detector, an encyclopaedia of archaeology, a flask of weak lemon drink Yay! and a blowtorch. <laughs> Many hobbyists like Neil Petark like to go metal detecting, where they get a metal detector and they detect metal. Then once they have detected the metal, they look at the metal they've detected it with the metal detector. The metal detecting idiots! However, my hobby is a much better hobby. This hobby is a good hobby if you enjoy walking in the countryside and have a deep-seated hatred of human civilization and all the artifacts it has left behind. This week's hobby is called Metal Desecrating. What you must do for this week's hobby. First, go to a place of historical interest. I am on the Scottish borders, on one of the purported sites of King Arthur's last battle. Now to go metal detecting, which I shall do in a satirical style so as to mock Neil Petock. <laughs> I'm Neil Petock. I like metal detecting. I'm... Now it's time to drink your weak lemon drink. I wonder what it can be. <laughs> According to my encyclopedia of archaeology, this is the Excalibur sword, a find of enormous historical import which proves the existence of the legendary King Arthur. Now to go metal desecrating. <laughs> Burn! Burn! Pour his sword! As you can see, the fire has completely burnt the sword away, and there's no evidence that it ever existed. This hobby is a good hobby if you enjoy annoying, boring, beardy archaeologists and Tony Robinson with his smug time team face. <laughs> Destroy all evidence of past life and of man's craftsmanship. All history is bunk compared to I. Now even King Arthur will have to bow down before me like all the other idiots! <laughs> Enjoy your hobbies. <laughs> Last week, we asked you to send in sitcom proposals using the British sitcom <coughs> formula, and the best one will be King. Here are some of the uh, other better ones. Um, Elliot Day suggested Bear With Me, uh, the plot summary, Ian Bear is a nudist. He is forced to look after a bear. <laughs> uh, Michael Steer sent in Men Beehiving Badly, uh, about the antics of two laddish beekeepers. <laughs> and uh, Steve Day suggested The Lively Birds, a uh, possible Denise Van Outen stroke Kelly Brook vehicle. The plot summary, there are some women, they are slags. <laughs> and, um, all the people mentioned there will win nothing, nothing at all. And yet, ironically, me and Rich will still get paid for writing that part of the show. <laughs> Ah, brilliant. But the best one, in our opinion, which will be getting its own 12-part BBC One series starting tomorrow, was this one by Natalie Sait, uh, Rotten to the Cause. Uh, Johnny Rotten owns a fruit stall. He's also part-time manager of the cause. <laughs> he spends so much time being rotten to the cause that each week his fruit always goes off. <laughs> At the end of each episode, he wonders why he is so rotten to the cause whilst eating some rotten fruit to the core. <laughs> Here is Queen Natalie. You must be very proud of that. Very proud. Uh, aren't you doing your finals uh, this very soon? Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't you spend some time revising? <laughs> I'm waiting. That's not going to get you a job, is it? You idiot! <laughs> Crown the Queen, please. Or King, crown her. Oh, 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 crown the Queen! Oh, Queen! Oh, Queen! Oh, Queen! Oh, Queen! Oh, Queen! Oh, Queen! And do you have any early laws you'd like to pass? Uh, just one. Everyone who does my degree has to appear on national television before Tuesday so that they'll all do as badly as I'm going to. That seems fair. <laughs> the Queen or, or King, King has spoken! <laughs> It's 
so I say to you, the kingdom of heaven is like a vineyard owner who went out to hire several men to work in a vineyard. Picking a few grapes? I doubt if he'd need several men. All right, Thomas. You're having a laugh, ain't you? <laughs> he needed many grapes to harvest their juice. Ah, juice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, juice, it's obvious what I meant. Come on. Now, the vineyard owner agreed to pay each of the hired men one denarius a day each. One denarius per person each day. OK, friends? Well, all of us, just to pick a few grapes. Yes, friend. Mm -hmm. yeah. And after three hours, the vineyard owner went back to the market to hire more men. Friends, I need all you men to, uh, carry some broken vines over to the fire. And so again, on the sixth and the ninth hour. I need more help in the vineyard, friends. Why? You've got 50 blokes working out there already. Yes, I know, but um, some of the grapes are dirty and uh, I need them cleaned. Uh, I need 20 more men. And at the 11th hour, he went out again. Friends, I need some men to supervise the grape cleaning. Look, I found this dirty grape in the palm hut clean. <laughs> when the evening came, the vineyard owner said to his foreman, Foreman friend, call the men together and pay them, starting with the last one hired, working through to the first one. One denarius for everybody. Off you go now, go on. Oh, well, well, hold on a minute. The great cleaning supervisors have only worked one hour at twilight, and they're getting paid the same as us, who've done 12 hours of hard work. It's not fair. Ah, but it is fair, friend. Did you not agree to work for one denarius? Well, yeah, ah. but... No, not all. It's not fair. You know, I, I wouldn't have agreed to do 12 hours of hard work for one denarius if you'd have said, oh, you can have one denarius for doing sod all. Ah, it's my money, friend. And if I choose to pay the last person that I hired the same as the first, then I can do that, friend. Ah. I'm warning you, do not go R again, all right? <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, friend. I mean it. You're just envious, friend, because I'm generous. You're not generous. You're mad. You don't pay someone who's done 12 hours of hard work the same who's done an hour of nothing. Ah! I said, don't do that. <laughs> oh, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to come up with some clever metaphor about the kingdom of heaven. Ah. Shut it! <laughs> Saying that um, it doesn't matter when people accept God because they still get the same reward. But it is not a good metaphor, is it? Because the case you've chosen is so clearly unfair to any right-thinking person that it makes your heaven system seem ridiculous, too. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> For the last time. Go on, admit it. I'm right. I admit it, friends, you're right! <laughs> Good. We'll be back here tomorrow to do some more grape-picking. And this time, you'll make the system fair, right? Yes, friend, I have learnt my lesson. Good. I haven't learned my lesson. I do the same again tomorrow. Ah. <laughs> save, save the mice. Do they know it's National World Animal Laboratories Week at all? No, no, Rich, they don't know that because they're mice, right? They don't know, and neither does anyone else. No one cares about it. Damn you, Richard Herring. Damn you to hell! Give us your mice. What's, what's this? Richard Herring's is hunger strike man. What's this? That's the right <laughs> way. That That's about? the right way of doing it. Don't you know anything? Anyway, it's good, Rich. You've got, you got over 30 mice there. That is small potatoes. No, mice. You've got over 30 oh, mice there. Oh, that's right. even better. Yeah. I've got the actual statistics here, right? Last year, in British laboratories, there were a million and a half experiments carried out on mice. Who cares? They were mice, mice of vermin. They deserve to die. That's what I say. <laughs> you've obviously never drunk their milk, Stu. No, I haven't. <laughs> They have every right to live. Mice are our friends. No, mice are your friends, aren't they? They're your only friends. And Bagpuss's friends. Yeah, all right. Too. The point is, <laughs> what would happen to that million and a half mice anyway if they weren't being experimented on? Well, I could look after them. Mean, where would they go? I could take them home and put them in my mouse hole. <laughs> your mouse hole? My mouse hole, as I sometimes call it. <laughs> When there are mice in it. Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> and would a million and a half mice fit in your mouse hole, Rich? It'd be a squash, you, but there is more room now that I've been on hunger strike. Right. <laughs> At least it'll get them out of the laboratories for a better life. A better life? 
Well, a different, different kind of eye. <laughs> my mouse hole's always wide open to receive any mice, Stu. <laughs> I'm not prejudiced. White mice, grey mice, brown mice. <laughs> any kind of mice, you know. <laughs> like, of course, just make up your own types. Any mice. Door mice. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea, but I'll catch you. You're, um, <laughs> you're at your shrine to the cause again. My cause shrine, Stu, call okay, it by his name. <laughs> the old hunger strike getting to you a bit there, is it? No, that wasn't my stomach, Stu. It was your no, stomach. No, it wasn't, Stu. It was Robbie Williams. What? <laughs> my, my tattoo of Robbie Williams is alive, Stu. Look. <laughs> you think that you're strong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Rich, please, I need food. I'm dying. <laughs> no, Robbie, I want you to die. Then Andrea will be mine. <laughs> it says in the sun she was spotted out with the bloke from Fun Living Criminals now. She's got a different fella every week, the slag. <laughs> Don't you talk about my Andrea like that. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> ah, ow, ow, that hurts. It hurts me more than it hurts you, Robbie. Ah, ah. Do you think it's fair to say, Rich, that a mere 20 minutes without food has affected the chemical balance of your brain. No, I don't. Right, you asked for it, Williams. Ah, oh, ah, oh, God, Stu. Robbie Williams tricked me, Stu. I so. Ah, ha, 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 But, you know, democracy kills me. <laughs> Brett versed. Yeah. I remember I saw Brett do this incredible hit at the store. I mean, who's this guy ruling over us now? What's his name? Bush. <laughs> Bush. What the hell is that all about, you know? About how President Bush, right, should really be called President Shrub. <laughs> that, is, that is brilliant. I think literally to think of him as a bush, as a real bush. I mean, might as well be called shrub. <laughs> you know? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, inauguration of President Shrub. <laughs> you know, and, and introducing uh, Vice President Senator Smalltree. I don't think anyone could take Bush seriously after that. And <laughs> President Bush, of course, is no longer President of the United States, and I don't think that's a coincidence. <laughs> I mean, did JFK die so we could vote in a plant? <laughs> I don't think so. Of course, most of the great American stand-ups of that time are dead. Kinnison, Bill Hicks. Brett Verst is still alive, though. But no one knows where he is, which is almost as good. And of course, uh, in the news this week, autoerotic contortionism and Irish dancing have been. Hey, hey, pour in another mouse! Damn, I could have used that for needless scientific experiments. <laughs> I am evil. <laughs> you're never, you're never going to fill that up, Rich. You're miles off. You know, I've been looking through these statistics. Right, uh, last year, 0.6 million experiments were carried out on rats which, as far as I'm concerned, isn't enough rats. Rats are man's enemy. No, they're our bewhiskered friends, Stu. No, yeah, you, you know they say in Britain you're never more than three feet away from a rat. That's ridiculous, Stu. Surely we'd notice, surely. It's true. <laughs> and the frightening thing is it's the same rat. You know, rats are so promiscuous, the rat population can actually triple in moments. Stop slagging off rats, Stu. <laughs> rats are no more promiscuous than you or I. No. Uh, have these rats showered and sent to my dressing room, please. TV comedy with live rats. You're sick. What you are. harm have rats 
<laughs> He's trying to get into my mouse hole, Stu. What rats? What harm have rats? What harm have rats ever done to okay, us? Okay, rats. What harm? Rats Name the, one thing. Rats brought the bubonic plague to Europe, killed millions of people. Well, forgive and forget, Stu. <laughs> In this war, the rats are on our side. That's the Germans, Rich. You've confused rats with the Germans. Ah, uh, yes, I have. <laughs> well, will I reach my total by the end of the show of mice? I don't know, but I know a man who does. And believe me when I say he is a man. <laughs> it's Nostradamus on his real horse, David Collins! <laughs> Flighty today, isn't he? Oh, he's very I've flighty. Never, <laughs> never seen him so flighty. Oh. It's not like him to be flighty. <laughs> now, first, let's look at your three predictions from last week. Remember, yeah. two out of three, these correct, and your patio will be graced with this charming garden barbecue. Oh. Barbecue, like a bird's beak. Oh, do you still need the fence and all? Because I'm happy you to You can't have the hand. fence. All right, come on, never mind. Now, come on, Nostama, stop that, David. It's not worth it. Now, no, so last week, you predicted that a cartoon would appear in a national newspaper of recently to see celebrity and arriving gates. at the pearly gates. The news said... <laughs> no, Ooh. that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, stop it. That's a Chinese burn for you, Nostradamus. Ow! Ow! <laughs> That's a very girlish scream, Nostradamus. Don't be stupid. Nostradamus was a man. I mean, I am a man! I've I got a winky and everything! No. You're a very stupid okay, man. All right. Come on, Steve, stop trying to undermine him. Undermine it's only him. your own insecurities you're exposing. Don't worry about it, Nostradamus. You're better than him. And you are, David. Second, you said that the comedian Stuart so Lee, the so-called comedian Stuart Lee, will be trampled by a by horse. horse. The news said... No, See, I remain untrampled. Oh, no! It's David Collins! I can't control him! Oh, gosh! Yeah, kick him while he's down! David! Ah. Stop it! David, it's, stop it! It's unbelievable! God. It's all happened! Get it's all happened, just oh. like Nostradamus it's said! self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy, it's Dude, a trick! David Collins he's is a horse, he can't God. understand English, how does he know? He's come back, pretty. Nostradamus, come back! Horse, in fact, so in fact, prediction number two gets, sir. Oh. Uh, there we go, so you want oh. just uh <laughs> he's clever. Just one more right, and the barbecue will be yours. Uh, will be egg like an egg. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. <laughs> Finally you said that they will think they have seen the sun at Jane night I... when they see the half pig man, man, and one will hear brute, brute beast speaking. Begin. The news said. <laughs> no. no, no, it was an <laughs> anagram. No, you're wrong, Mr. Dimas. <laughs> Smash the barbecue! This means oh. another Chinese burn for you, Nostradamus, and the series this week, I'm going to have to tickle you. Oh, no, 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 he's so ticklish, but I like it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my, Nostradamus, what a sight. I see you've got a Robbie tattoo, too. We've got so much in common. <laughs> you know, Nostradamus, if only you weren't a man, I think that... What? No, <laughs> it can't be! <laughs> Move quickly on. What are your predictions for next week? Prediction number one, EastEnders will be BBC One's most watched programme. It's always the most... <laughs> Prediction number two, York City will lose 3-1 to Bournemouth. They always <laughs> lose. <laughs> and prediction number three, I, Nostradamus, will once again fail to win the barbecue next week. You always <laughs> fail. And, uh, can you come back next week to see if you get those right? Will you be here? Yeah. Then it's a date. <laughs> Bye, Nostradamus. Bye, Rich. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what? Nostradamus what? and his horse, David Collins. There. Priests would have us believe that God on high is merciful and that he loves and cherishes humanity. I'm Greg Evigan, Rick Barish, in Edney Buchanan's Crimes of Passion. And what I say is, if God truly does love us, why does he allow things to get knocked over, spill, and fall out of cupboards. This week, beans. I've just gone to get something from the fridge. I, I don't know how. You must have caught a wrist on something. Mm, yeah, I mean, I don't know how, but this massive open tin of beans just fell out. <laughs> spilled into that tin of beans and the glass. So you thought it would be quite repulsive, wouldn't you? Sort of a woman with... Oh, cold beans all over it. 
You did a trip for me, I tell you. I'd, I'd just come out of a long and loveless marriage, and my husband Peter. Hey, Peter wasn't very sexually adventurous, so I just let myself go. <laughs> Yeah, of course, Tessa bloody kids come in and spoil it. Carl. Yes, Tim did come in and I think what well, is all distressed him. Well, he's got to learn sooner or later, haven't he? You know, sex is nature's gift to me. Carl was just helping me with the tea, love. Lots of fish fingers. <laughs> but Tim's not been himself since the divorce. That doesn't help, does he? No. Apparently he threw some beetroot at him last week. He was drunk. Idiot. But, you know, the boy needs a father. Yeah, not like that. He don't throw beetroot around like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> Faced with this story, we can only sit, mouths agog, and wonder what kind of merciful God would mock an innocent young boy like Tim Gibbs Norman with such a foul, bean-ridden travesty of the act of love. Surely only a God of hate. I'm Greg Evigan. Join me again next week as we see what happens when things get knocked over, spill, or fall out of cupboards. I made this. <laughs>the executive committee of the National World Week for Animals in Laboratories. Oh, no, I haven't. No, you have. You're, you're embarrassed, aren't you? Yeah. See? Yeah. But most of all, you've embarrassed yourself. Shut up. <laughs> anyway, last week he escaped like some juice-filled Hannibal Lecter, but he's back in captivity and as curious as ever, it's the Curious Orange! <laughs> Curious Orange, and what have you been curious about? Well, yeah. no. <laughs> no, Rich, I've replaced the Curious Orange with something less dangerous to human life. The Curious Alien. What? The Curious Orange may have been a dangerous psychopathic citrus future, but he was my flesh and blood. Forget him now, Rich. Anyway, <laughs> what are you curious about this week? The Curious Alien. <laughs> In answer to your query... That's yeah. no oh, good, Stu! Good. You can't understand a word he's I, saying! I can. It's like Sooty with Matthew Corby. <laughs> I understand <laughs> what he's saying. Look what he's doing, now, Stu. He's just as badly behaved. He's oh, good, Rich. as the orange, Stu, this is hardly an improvement. You should stick with what you know. You said that, Rich, when they bought in salt and Lineker crisps. And yet you eat them now. Look. <laughs> you can't replace the orange just because he's killed a couple of people. Your too. son is gone. He's he gone, isn't Rich. Gone, Stu. Forget him. Hey, what's going on? What's happening? You're replaced, Curious Orange. Go, hence, from this place. All right. <laughs> if no one wants me. <laughs> no, no! It's no good, Rich. He's gone. Gone oh. for all way. Curse you! God! <laughs> You just caught me enjoying a summery snack. Frozen polar bear milk on a stick. <laughs> oh, the delicious irony. This week, I'm drinking duckbill platypus milk. <laughs> Is it?
It's got a bill like a bird. It swims like a fish. It lays eggs like some kind of freaky lizard. But this aberration of nature is actually a mammal. Believe it or not, it's true. But I'm not complaining, because that means it suckles its young, or anyone else who fancies a suckle. Now, quarantine laws mean this little fella's got to stay in his box. But that won't stop me. I've got this. Mm. And the taste, it's fantastic. The creme de la creme of milk, full of antipodean goodness. I thank God that the duckbill platypus came through its bird-like fishiness as a mammal. Ten out of ten. And there'll always be milk. Shut up, you like it. <laughs> there will always be milk. Now, uh, maybe you've got a good reason why you think you should be king of the show. Well, then do write in and let us know at the address at the end of the programme or email us. And that could be you sitting there eating a cold shepherd's pie next week. <laughs> uh, I was looking down your uh, figures oh, yeah. of animal experiments, Rich. Now, last year in uh, British laboratories, and this is true at the other end of the scale, there were three experiments on greyhounds three. and one on a quail. <laughs> that is one vain scientist who thinks he's, like, too good to experiment on mice. One basically. experiment? They just have one thing to learn. What one thing uh, was it that was, um, It was what would happen to a quail if you put it in a blender. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't really a proper experiment. It was just the end of year party. People at the lab got a bit drunk, overexcited. Things got out of hand, you know. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> Members of obscure cults. Are you nuts? <laughs> Only ninnies would devote their lives to following someone who claims to be the son of God. And before you say it, no, it isn't the same as the early days of Christianity. And do you know why? No. Of course you don't. <laughs> Stu, I can't believe it. Look, people have been joining together, bringing mice in the studio to help me. Together, all races together, we've saved the mice. Oh, oh the, the minute. Look, the mouseometer is full, Stu. Yeah, Rich, it is full. We yeah. did it. It's full, I yeah, tell you. Yeah, but that's a design it's full. Full to the brim. Yeah, Rich, it's full to the brim of dead mice. <laughs> Good, because now I have discovered what happens when you fill an airtight container with a hundred mice. <laughs> uh, at least I'm I can uh, have to come off my hunger strike now, yeah, Stu. Right. Yeah, great, can't wait. Ah, what's happening? Well, we'll be back next week ah. with the new star of the show, The Curious Alien. Yeah, who's going to sing us out, Stu? The Curious Alien, with a song for animals everywhere. Where's rubbish? Oh, it's good as well, isn't it? Ah. 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 My main interest is the extermination of all human life, uh, so I think I would make an excellent assassin or mercenary. No, no, I haven't actually had any training in the art of death. I'm a citrus fruit, but, but I'm, I'm keen to learn. So do you think it's worthwhile for me to come in for an interview? Hello?